Hello and welcome to this video and this video is called Every Creative Person Should Watch This which is a very clickbaity title isn't it and it's made you click on it and you've come here to watch this video thinking wonder what he's going to talk about and uh, worried that I might not come up with the goods well I'm going to try my best to come up with something here which will be of interest to you if you are a creative person and the thing I would like to discuss is the relationship between creativity and mental health. Specifically, the mental health issues of anxiety and depression. I am a lecturer in music and every year I have a new group of young musicians uh, arrive in my class. They're all creative people. They've all been on a journey by the age of 16. They've been, already been on a journey to arrive in this music college. They've invested themselves in a creative path. And uh, at the beginning of the year, I always stand up and say, right, I don't need to ask you this, but I know most of you in this room are suffering with either anxiety or depression. And they all react. They all go, oh my God, how does he know this? How does he know I've got anxiety and depression? I've been covering this up for years, because this is one of the traits of being especially anxious is that um, you cover it up, you make excuses, you try and get out of things in life by um, saying, oh, I can't do this because my car's broken down or, you know, I haven't got the right clothes or whatever it is. But really, it's because you're suffering with anxiety. So um, how, could, how do I know that? How do I know that, you know, the musicians that arrive at my college are going to be suffering with anxiety and depression? It's through experience. I've seen it over and over again. The proportions of creative people that I know that also suffer with anxiety and depression is very high. And that got me thinking, over the years that's got me thinking. Now, um, this video we're gonna explore that area. Um, I am not a psychologist and I have no qualification in psychology. I'm not gonna come at this from a psychological point of view. I am a creative musician, I'm an artist, and I am a music lecturer. And I'm gonna be coming from it from that point of view. So you could say, well, you know, how can you talk about anxiety, depression, when you don't know anything about it? Well, um, like the musicians I have in my class, and like the many of my friends, I had terrible anxiety as a teenager. It developed around about the age of 15, and it was pretty debilitating. Um, I managed to get it under control and get over it. And I think now, at my age 53, I pretty much have my anxieties under control. So I'm going to be drawing from that um, real experience of my own as well, you know. So when you put all those factors in, you know, living a life, making music, you know, teaching music, having to teach other people music, um, what I found is really understanding how anxiety and depression works now it relates to creativity is very, very important. So I'm hoping you've clicked on the video, you know, because I've got this very clickbaity title, I hope you've clicked on and now I've piqued your interest. So let's get into the relationship between anxiety, depression and creativity. Right. So let's start right back at the beginning and think about what human beings really are. We're animals, right? We're here to do one thing and that's stay alive and reproduce. OK, we've evolved a mind and our mind has evolved um, really efficient ways of doing that. OK, um, so let us explain how that could have come about. So Im imagine you are God, right? Now, um, I profess no religious beliefs here. This is a complete philosophical experiment, right? So imagine you are God and you make a human being and you put drop the human being on Earth. And the human being just sits there and does absolutely nothing. And you think, well, I need it to go and get food. And I can't tell it what foods to eat. I need it to go and sort of find out what foods to eat. So I'm going to put into that human being an exploratory interest, you know, joy for life, you know. Um, and I'm going to reward when they, they, when they do it, right, I'm going to reward them with pleasure. That's a great thing. So now the human being comes out and goes, oh, brilliant. And it runs out and it sees some um, berries, and the berries go, oh, well, I bet they look delicious, you know, and it eats the berries and they taste absolutely lovely. And the human goes, oh, this is lovely. I love this. And it runs to the next bush and there's some other berries there. And uh, it eats those berries and it drops down dead because they're poisonous berries. And the other human beings with all this exploratory interest look round and see the one that's just dropped down dead and went, oh, that's interesting. They dropped down dead. 
I might try that and they run up and eat the berries and they all drop down dead. And God stands back and goes, oh, hang on. These exploratory things are not good enough because if they explore everything, they'll get into danger. So I need them to have some sort of system which is checking for dangers as well. And we will call that anxiety, right? We will call that fear. So this is why we have fear. We have fear to keep us alive. And it's a balance. Life's a balance between that exploratoriness and it's a balance between that fear that stops us from dying, right? Now, when you're out exploring the world, you're actually in the moment. So we have a part of us that exists in the moment. And that's the one that is... In, is looking for pleasure, looking for interest. It's the, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you walk out into the countryside and you see the sun coming up, you go, oh, this is lovely. And you are in the moment of that moment, enjoying the pleasure of being alive, right? Um, to stay alive, however, you've got to do two things. You've got to project into the future. You've got to be able to go, if I eat those berries, I could die. Right, so anxiety is very, is what I call future-based thinking, okay? It's um, plotting what's going to happen in the future. Everybody has to do this. It's a thing of being alive, it keeps you alive. Also, you have to be able to go back and say, everybody who ate those specific berries, they all died, but the ones who ate those um, are alive. That's past thinking. Now we're thinking into the past. So human beings have these two things going on. They're in the moment, right? But they're also projecting into the future and they're projecting into the past, right? And they do this to stay alive. They have to check these things, you know. Um, all human knowledge, right, science, you know, and truth is all about um, going back into the past and then trying to project into the future based upon what you know in the past. So I see human beings as have these, having these two parameters to them. The in the now, wonder, you know, is it life wonderful? parameter and they have the um you know what's going to happen and i'm going to look at the past and look into the future to try and guess what's going to happen to try and stay alive we have those two things now those two things that are competing they're competing things in our mind right some psychologists have said that the uh, what's really interesting about all brains not just human brains is is they are divided into two halves and um, those two halves are completely different. And it does seem the one half is um, associated with all the exploration and pleasure and being in the moment. And um, people often say that's the creative side. I don't think that's the case. Any creative person knows that the creativity isn't all about being in the moment. And we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and the other part of the brain is um, all about, you know, going into the past and projecting into the future is time-based. So we can almost see that the brain is divided into a space-based thing, being in the now, moving around, and a time-based thing, you know, what's happened in the past and how's, how are we gonna predict that into the future? I think that's the basic makeup of how human beings work. We've evolved that and it's highly sophisticated, all right? So say you now you've got human beings on the earth and they're toddling along with this way of thinking, right? Now, one of the great problems with being an animal or a human being is terrible disasters could come your way. And these death disasters aren't obvious. They're not predictable like what happened this morning and what's going to happen this afternoon. You know, great floods, ice ages, you know, uh, the emergence of certain predators. So human beings would have existed in an uncertain world, right? Um, and I think this is where a lot of superstitions and eventually religions come from, is, is trying to predict that more difficult side of human nature. You know, well, how do we get all our you know, where's all the berries gone? You know, we've had a terrible winter, how do we get them back, you know? And I think um, in human evolution, there's been certain points where um, there has been disasters that have brought the population of the human population on Earth down to really low numbers, right? And the way we've survived was probably by moving on, probably changing our ways. You know, it would have been a drastic shift where someone had gone, right, I don't think we should stay here. I think we should move. All right. Now, I'm pretty sure that that wasn't the whole of the population saying that. If you've got a little village, it wouldn't be the whole population saying, shall we move? It will be some, you know, shaman type. Someone who is more connected in to the 
sensitive to their surroundings. They notice more. They notice more about the flowers and the weather. They notice more about the land, the way things are acting. They're more sensitive than the average person. So imagine we have these more sensitive beings, right? And they're watching stuff and they're doing that past future thing, uh, right? Um, very aesthetic. There's no science there at the moment. They're, they're having to judge things entirely about how the world feels to them. Okay? And these people who are very sensitive could probably predict things were going to happen. They probably had a, a better idea of, of how things worked. They also probably um, would be able to direct people in the group. Now, it's, it's a, there's an argument that art and music develops as a sort of communal thing. It brings people together, you know, and that the, the hunters would, would be able to understand what they were trying to do by the artwork that you see in caves. You know, they, there's, there's pictures of the animals they hunted. And not only are they painting them to fix on them so they know they've got to hunt them, but they also respect them and they look after them in the same way. This is where art begins, I think. And, it, and there would be certain individuals that are very sensitive. Now, these individuals, you know, are probably the ones who turn around to the rest of the group and said, I think we should leave here. Something bad is about to happen. There's impending doom coming our way. We need to move. And those tribes that would move, based upon those sort of artistic shaman types, they survived. The ones that didn't, didn't. So through human evolution, you could argue that the, the role that creative people were doing, because this is what they were, right? That would have evolved. Creativity is a survival instinct that human beings need. Because creativity is basically a sensitivity to the aesthetic world around us and a reaction to it. And that fundamentally is about deciding what's good and what's not good. That's what artists do. They go, look, I think this is good. And everyone else goes, yeah, I think you're right there. And the readjustment of what is good is essential for human survival. So now we have this evolutional bottleneck that's created in society a high level of very creative people, right? If you've clicked on this video because you're a creative person, you've probably evolved from that strain of people. You would have been a shaman in the old days. You know, you're, you are very sensitive to the world around you, right? That is a skill. But being very sensitive to the world around you is not only a skill, but it's also a curse. All right. So creative people, what they do is they're very sensitive to things. All right. So if you're a music musician, right, and you play, you're playing your guitar, right. Successful musicians are the ones who are able to suss out when they sound bad. Okay. If you're a studio engineer, okay, and you've got to add reverb to a vocal, your skill is you've got to be highly sensitive to microscopic changes in the, the um, sending of sound to a, an effect. And you've got to dial that up, and the only judgment you've got is where your body goes, well, that, that feels right now. Right? Some people are better at that but because they're more sensitive. You know, the artist that can look at something and really see it and go, those bricks I'm painting, they're not red. You know, I believe them to be red, but when I look, they're actually purple. And they dip, they're painting the purple and they get the colour exactly right. Those who can look out into the world and see it more deeply, they are more sensitive. Okay? Now, those of you who have ever watched American Idol, Pop Idol and X Facts will have noticed certain things, right? Is that... When we watch it, at the beginning, they audition all these different people and they all come in and we laugh because they're not very good, but we don't laugh because they're not very good. You know, most people at home can't sing as well as that. So we're not, we're not laughing at their lack of skill. What we're laughing is their inability to see that they're not very good, all right? This means that artists who aren't very good uh, are not sensitive enough to their own um, output, all right? to uh, see where it's not sounding great. Those are very sensitive to that. Those have gone, well, I've done that and that bit's a little bit out of tune, but the, well, that, that line's not correct, or the way I've just you described this sentence isn't truthful or accurate. The artists that can do that, you know, to look at themselves and continually, um, you know, 
keep changing it to get it better and better, they're the ones that get become great artists. So um, creative people are people who are very sensitive, but are also able to be very self-critical. Now put those traits together. Sensitive and critical. Those are the skills we need to be a creative person. And we're needed by society as well. God, do they need us. Because every aesthetic decision, and remember, aesthetics is basically what we think is good or bad, what we think we like and we don't like. From that, we then base our morals, we base our ethics, we base our political systems, are all based upon human being, being able to decide what is good and decide what is good in a good way, you know, in an efficient way, you know. Um, so, God, the creative people are needed because they're doing that all day long and they're doing it at a high level. But the skills they need to do it is they need to be very sensitive and very critical. Okay? Now, some people will be fixed in the future. You know, their minds are um, always thinking ahead. Right? And that's a really positive trait and we need people in society who can do that. And we need positive thinkers. Positive thinkers are people that exist in the future but exist in the future and try and see it as positive as they possibly can. But if you've got sensitivity and you've got very self-criticalness, right, which means you're going to put yourself under the microscope, that will lead to you doubting yourself. If, if you are doubting yourself and then looking into the future, you are going to be very worried that there's going to be some sort of failure. A failure that will actually equal your own death. All right? Because remember what we said right at the beginning, that anxiety is really a thing to keep you alive. That's why we've got it there. Okay? Now, I think that if you go back to those sort of um, tribal societies, when someone's transgressed in that society, they were probably ejected from it. And then being ejected from that society meant that you'd done something wrong, we don't like you, we kick you out, and you wandered into the wilderness and you died. Right? So... Um, the ejection from society for um, a transgression against a sort of moral code is a scary thing for us all. It's wound into us, all right? So artists that will believe that their art will be badly received in some way, all right? That's a transgression. You know, for an artist to stand up like those people in X Factor and sing and everyone going, oh my God, they're terrible. You've transgressed that way of doing it. Everyone's now turning on you a little bit. And, and that feeling, which doesn't threaten us at all in a modern society, but uh, in an ancient society, it could well have been a personal threat, a life, a life threatening threat. So I think that's, I think I've explained there why artists act the way they do. Okay. Um, but also you could be somebody who dwells in the past, you know, um, Dwelling in the past is a fantastic thing, you know, looking back at history, looking back at your own personal history, to be able to learn from it. You know, that's really, really important. But again, if you have got, you're highly sensitive to things and you're self-critical, you will look back with high sensitivity and criticise your own past. Oh my God, never think, never th anything went well to me, I'm cursed. I'm cursed with these terrible things. And I think that's where depression comes from. So anxiety and orders and depression, I hope I now explain where they're coming from, from what I think is the case and how they relate to creativity. I really believe that the reason why we have anxiety and depression in society is not some stupid thing that is just a waste of time. Why do we need this? Why do we need all this anxiety and depression? No, it's linked to the high level of creativity that human beings have. All right. As I said, there is a clash between these two things going on. The in the now pleasure, hedonistic view of the world where it's just, it's just our playground right now. Let's go out and have some fun. And then, no, you've got to worry, you know, what's happened before, what's happened in the future, that type of thinking. Those things are in, in, they're in human beings. They're, there's a battle going on between those two things. It's really... Um, embedded in the art of our society. It goes right back to the Greeks with Apollo and Dionysus, you know. So, you know, you know, Dionysus was the was the god of sort of wine and drinking and partying and having fun. 
you know, and also creativity. And then Apollo was the god of sort of order and, you know, rationalism. And they're, they're in opposition. We see this, and I've spoken about this on other videos, if you want to check through my other videos, where I really think that art isn't all about hedonism and pleasure, right? And as those of you watching you go, well, my art doesn't seem to be that. It seems to be a lot more about order. It's a lot more Ap Ap Apollonian. I spend all my time going through, looking at what I've done, going, oh, it's terrible, and trying to put it right. It's, it's much, I, I'm much more of a perfectionist than a hedonist. You're both. Hedonism's about pleasure. Perfectionism's about order. All great art is a balance between hedonism and perfectionism. It, what it does is it marries those up in a fantastically interesting way, which is relevant to the contemporary society that, that that art is created in. That statement there is really, I think, what art tries to do. When you're an artist, you're very sensitive. You're, the, the emotionalism is wound in. You don't have to worry about that. If, you, if you've got anxiety and depression, you go through the whole of every day in a heightened emotional state, okay? So when you create your art, it's very easy for you to go, this is what this feels like, because that terrifies me. And this is what this feels like, because this makes me depressed. That's the skill of the artist, right? But you take that and then you inflict order on it. And the order that we inflict on it as artists often comes from our own self-loathing, our own self-criticism of going, this isn't good enough, right? And so that thing there is integrated into what an artist is. And what that does, is it creates art which is highly developed, which then the rest of society can look at and go, oh my God, they have really balanced hedonism and perfectionism brilliantly there. I can understand how to do that in my line of business now, whatever I'm trying to do, which is usually moral and ethical decisions, right? How many moral and ethical decisions have been made due to art? I would say all of them fundamentally. How many of you have watched a documentary or seen, read a book or seen a painting about something that's changed your opinion morally about something? You see? If you're trying to explain a moral thing, I'm not saying all art's about morality because aesthetics is actually above that. Aesthetics, you could be just say, isn't that a beautiful flower? You know, or isn't it ter terrifying when you have to go in, into a group of people and socialise with them? These aren't really moral statements, but morality comes from that. Because also, if you say, you never want to say, I don't think we should kill animals or the, the, the um, you know, there's climate change, we need to do something about it. You cannot always get that across logically. Of course, logic and, and argument is really important, but also we need to feel it. And artists make us feel it. And that is really important. Often, often logical decisions only take you so far when it comes to morality. You know, you have to come to a certain point where you go, this, I think I like this and I want to keep it. I think it needs, it's valued. The, the earth is a, is a place I like. It's beautiful. Look at the trees, look at the flowers, look at the lakes, look at the sea, look at the animals. And we need to keep it because it's valuable, right? So the role of the artist is really, really important. To be a good artist, you're going to be a very sensitive, and very self-critical, which I'm now going to call have self-loathing. That is an essential quality to drive you to, to, to balance this, the extreme emotions you feel about life, which are often more than normal people, based upon you looking back into the past too much and dwelling on it, you know. That is a, that's a, a machine for the artist to be able to do that or being able to project into the future and your anxieties about that, okay? Um, often, from artists, okay, and here we come to the crunch. Artists, if my argument is correct, and these anxiety and depression disorders are linked directly to creativity, they are the machine that drives creativity. So if you're suffering with anxiety and depression, what the problem probably is for you is they are not being turned on creative, creativity, making art, making music. They're not being directed on that. So what happens when you don't direct it on that? Because as I've argued, they're brilliant skills. 
right? You know, if you do go over the past, you go through your own personal history and you find things in there that weren't right, that makes you low and depressed. That is, that's the storyline of every great art, right? If you project yourself into the future and catastrophize and think terrible things are going to happen, okay? When you create music and art, that actually brings you back into the moment. All right? Those two things are really, really important. So we can see that for the creative person, creating the art is the therapy. I don't know how much this has been understood by psychology, which is now trying to battle these issues with uh, tablets. You know, it's trying to train people out of doing it so they don't have those type of thought patterns. I often wonder whether the best way of dealing with anxiety, depression, is by being really creative. So we then come to a problem that creative people have, is that that process I've described, it's not guaranteed. The anxiety and depression can actually stop you in your tracks. You know, um, most artists will look back at everything they've done and when they listen to it or look at it, it will seem terrible to them. That's like the depression bit, looking back at your own personal history and seeing it as being bad, right? And then predicting a future that will be bad based upon that. Um, that is one of the hurdles that many creative artists fall at. I am going to come, try and come up with a solution to this in this video for you, so if you keep watching. Um, many artists will get terrified. Their anxiety will stop them from presenting the art because they think that they will be judged badly. A lot of anxiety is, best, is social anxiety, I think. It's based upon people judging you. Okay? They're going to look at you and go, oh my God, they're terrible. They smell. They're ugly. Right? They don't act properly. They're embarrassing. We don't like them. We've got to eject them from our social group. Eject them. Cast them into the wilderness where they will starve and die. I think that's the roost of most anxiety. So creative people want to be creative. They want to make the art. But they have the dilemma that at some point they've got to put the art out. Depressing, depressed people have this massive machine which is, is really able to, you know, the emotion which they are able to draw on about pointing out, you know, how life can be difficult for, for people, right? That can stop you anyway, because when you're depressed, you don't feel like doing anything, right? The answer's right in front of you. Get the art done, get it out, get it finished, but you don't want to. The anxious person, the answer's there in front of you. Get the art out and get into the therapy, but you don't want to because you may be judged, right? So creative people out there watching this, that clicked on my little clickbaity title. I'm going to tell you this. The reason you're here is because you're creative and the anxiety and depression go hand in hand. All right. How do you solve the anxiety and depression? By being creative all the time. Have you noticed, creative people, that when you're being creative, in the moment of being creative, when you're doing it, you haven't got anxiety and depression. The more you can be creative, right? The more you won't be anxious and depressed because it's the machine that drives that. That's what it's there for. It's like the accelerator in your car, right? It's designed to drive the car. What you're doing is holding the brake down and the accelerator at the same time. You have to make the art, but you don't want to make the art. If you've got depression, you don't want to do anything. So that's the dilemma you're in. You know, what's the point? No one will like it. No one's going to be interested, right? So there's no point in doing it, okay? That's the problem you've got. And the reason you've got a problem is because you're not seeing the art correct, right? Anxious people, oh, I've made this art, but it's terrible. It seems terrible. If I put it out, everyone will judge me and they'll think I'm terrible. So I'm not going to put it out, right? That's your problem. There is only one way to beat this problem, creative people out there, and that is to put the stuff out into the world. Right? Creativity works in a circle. 
it starts an experience, like we said, you know, pleasurable or hedonist experience or to be more accurate for the creative person, terror and depression. Feelings, that's the way it starts. Art always starts with feelings in the world. You step out in the world and have feelings. You cannot make art unless you have those feelings. Those feelings start to coalesce in sort of random floaty ideas and concepts. You notice things about the world. You go, oh my God, that's weird that is. And you know, that's, that's threatening, that thing is. But it's also, it's good for you. A little bit about what my video is about today. That's good. So how could I put that into a piece of art? Right? These abstract ideas float around and they coalesce into to real ideas. And those real ideas start with ex experimentation. You might try something. You look at what you're doing and you think, oh, that's really cool that is. Right? And at some point you create a piece of art. Now you might be getting stuck on that circle. The anxiety of depression might be catching you out and I might need another video to really get into how to get around that. Right? But at some point you're stuck. Okay? Now, if you don't go around the circle, and the way you finish the circle is then you create the art, and then the art has to go out into the world, and it has to be seen by one person. Two people's better. A hundred people's great. A thousand people's brilliant. Great. Right, but it has to be seen by somebody, because you have to experience it going and existing in the world. I think that is really, really important, because that's what you're designed to do. You put this thing out there. It's not down to you to judge it. You're the artist, you're not the critic. Right? You cannot judge your own art. All you can do is put it out into the world. And when you put it out into the world, it will change the world. And in changing the world, it will change your experience. Anybody who's ever put a piece of art out there, had an exhibition or put a track out, will notice, even though it might have been listened to very few people, the experience to yourself is really great. You change when you put art out into the world. Right? And when you put art out in the world, it feeds back and it creates a new experience. You go around this circle, this circle of creativity. You keep going around it. To beat the anxiety and the pressure, you have to keep going around that circle for the rest of your life. And the only way to do it is to continually put art and music out there. That's the thing you're not doing. If you suffer with anxiety and depression, you've got to bite the bullet and put it out there and say, you know, I don't know. I don't know whether it's any good in the end. I've done it and it's what I'm doing. I can't help it, it's what I do, right? I will let everybody else be the judge of whether it's any good. I will let everybody be, everyone else be the judge if it's got any utility or use, right? But if it hasn't, it does not matter because I need to get around the circle and get to another point. The truth is, artists, right? Is if you think you're gonna go around that circle once and achieve this, you won't. You have to go around the circle over and over again. Every great artist has been around the circle a hundred times. You know, the art or music that has any utility in the world, even slightly, is very, very rare. Our job's to make it all day long, right? But the art and music that we create, they'll have any utility to anybody, any use or any enjoyment or, or, or give them any wisdom or whatever it is that art does. That will happen every now and then. You're not in control of it. You cannot judge, you know, you cannot judge the utility of using your self-loathing to judge it, right? Because you looking good is not what it's about. Art and music is not about you looking good. That's something you have to understand, right? It's in there. The perfect, that's perfectionism. It's in there. But it has to be balanced with hedonism. Do you know they might have artists that fail because they're just too perfectionist? They are eyeing out every little bit of emotion. There's no emotion in it anymore. It's all perfection because that's all they're scanning it for. And they put it out in the world and then people don't feel anything when they look at it or listen to it. They don't feel anything. And people want to feel stuff. They want to feel stuff in a novel way because it tells them about themselves and about the world. Okay? Your job as an artist is not even to consider that. It's not to worry about that. Your job as an artist is to take that anxiety and depression and channel it into making art, and you do it every single day. Every great artist makes loads and loads of art. They might edit it, and they might only put something out every few years. But very few artists don't do art. Artists that are great make art and music all day long. Okay? 
Um, and when I say get it out there, I don't mean put it out in the public realm. You know, you may, if you're, an, if you're a musician, you may just create a folder and put the music in there, but you must finish it and you must play it to someone. That's really important. But I do think you should get it out there. I think every artist should put their stuff out there and let it live. It moves you forward, all right? Your job as an artist is not to become famous. It's not to play some silly game, right? On the internet of trying to be liked. Nothing will come from that. Your job as an artist is to create, is to make stuff, all right? That process, you know how that process works, it's in there. Yes, perfectionism is useful, but it's limited. You'd have to, you have to know when to stop and go, right, I've done that enough, let's just move on. After when you're stuck, the best way to get out of being stuck is to go, right, this is the art, it's done. This was a failure, let's put it there. All right? Um, I've made records which I thought were failures. I've made records that I didn't put out and didn't let anyone hear. I've been in situations where some, somebody's turned around and said, have you got any like drum loops or drum samples? And I've gone, well, I've got this music here, which is uh, um, it's just terrible, but there might be some nice drum stuff we could salvage from it. And when I've played it to that person, they've turned around and gone, oh my God, this stuff's amazing. What is this music? Well, that's this music I made. I didn't, I didn't really understand it at the time. That was the case. I didn't understand what I'd done. This has happened to me a few times in life. You cannot judge whether it's good or not. You know, that thing that seems sprawling and wrong and it's full of errors can be so filled with emotion that it can affect somebody else in a way that you can't understand. So, let's pull all of this together. Creative people tend to be anxious and depressed. That comes from them to having an excessive sensitivity and self-loathing, which seems to be a very useful thing for certain people in our society to have. It was probably evolved and has a role that's really, really important. Okay, um, Creative people, because they have that machine inside them, and anyone with anxiety and depression, well, I'll tell you, it feels like a machine. It's an energy that's pushing all the time. Right, that needs to be used. You have to be creative every single day. Okay, if you are creative, it should the anxiety and depression should balance, and you'll have it in in balance. Then you'll have it under your control. When it comes in, you'll know what to do with it. But people don't because they get stuck because they don't go around the circle of creativity and their job is to keep going around that circle of creativity. Their job is not to become famous or chase likes. Their job is to keep going. Their job is to learn how to sustain themselves as an artist. And that means to be able to do your art for the rest of your life. That's your job. It doesn't matter about making money out of it. It doesn't matter about how, whether anybody likes it or not. Those things don't matter. You've only got one goal and to keep going at all costs. doesn't matter how you do it. Maybe you have a job and you make the art yourselves and you just stick it in the wall at home and only your friends see it. Maybe you're a musician and you, you've, you just have got enough money to get a little studio in your house, right? And you set up a band camp and you just put the stuff out there. Nobody listens to it. It doesn't matter. It's there. People want to listen to it. It's there. Your friends can hear it. It's there. You can go and hear it. You can look back at all the work you've done after doing it for 10 years ago. Oh my God, look, there's 30 albums I've made. You could look back like past thinking. You could go back and say, oh my God, I started there and now I'm doing this. You'll learn about yourself. Your job is to sustain and keep going and get the stuff out there. What's probably going wrong is you're not getting out there. And the reason you're not going right, getting the stuff out there, as I've said, is because you've been too much of a perfectionist. You're worried about what people think about it. Or you think there's no point. Okay? Those are, the, those are the things that undo every artist. It's two thoughts. You're not good enough. And there's no point. Because the competition's too great. 
Those are the two ideas that undo every single artist. Just ignore them. They're not true. Right? Being good enough is nothing to do about it. You're a creative person. If you've got anxiety and depression, it's there. You know it. Make your art. You don't know whether it's good or not. Put it out there. Right? There's too many people doing it. Yeah, but your job's not to become famous or successful. That's not what's there. You think you need to become famous and successful because you think it will somehow enable you to sustain your creative creativity and creative making. But you don't need that to sustain that. You've just got to work out any way to do that. And you can work a way of doing that. Everyone can work out a way of being creative. Right? You might have to get your life in order a little bit. You might have to have your life in a little bit more control so you've got the time and the space and a little bit of money to do it. But again, that's a different video. All right? But hopefully I've explained to creative people what they need to do and how they need to do it. All right? One more thing. All right? You have to learn how to be creative. That's my job. I work in a college and I teach uh, music, but really I teach creativity. Okay? Um, you may be a creative person. You may have all that anxiety and depression, sensitivity and self-criticism, self-loathing, all those things required to be a great creative person. But there's rules to creativity. I've tried to explain some of them in this video. But there's rules to creativity and you need to be able to understand those rules so you can operate better. That is what the role of music education is. Okay? When you make art, some of it is intuitive. It's like anything you do. You know, if you were wanting to do knitting or fishing or understand how to repair a car, there's things that are intuitive. You don't need a teacher to come and tell you how to do them. You know how to do them, right? But there's other things that are counterintuitive. I've come across this in music over and over again. They're counterintuitive, okay? Some of the things I've talked about today will seem to you counterintuitive. You probably sat there going through your music and art, picking it to death. You probably think that that's part of the process. It's really good that you do that. And if you do that enough, then the art will be really good because it will be perfect. And here I'm coming along saying, no, it needs to be less perfect and have more feeling in there. And you've got to get that balance right. That's what a great artist does, is balance those things, not go all the way over to perfectionism. Right, And you listen to that and go, no, nah, that doesn't feel right to me. That is counterintuitive to most artists who are perfectionists. Right? Perfectionism is the enemy of creativity. Hedonism is the enemy of creativity. But particularly perfectionism. That really is an enemy for you. You have to battle against it. You have to have strategies in place. Right? that stop you from going down that route. You know Brian Eno's little cards he made? Those creativity cards, the oblique strategies? And when you get stuck, when you're not going around the circle anymore, you're supposed to look at one of these cards. And that card introduces this kind of intellectual chaos into the mix. All those cards, if you look at it, what they're doing is they're trying to stop perfectionism rearing its ugly head. If it tells you to do a keyboard solo with just two fingers, you know, what that's doing is to stop you in your tracks of thinking you know what is right. The artist who thinks they know what's right is not an artist. Right? Artists don't know what's right. That's why they're doing it. You know, so perfectionism has to be got under control. It needs to be there to a certain extent. If you haven't got perfectionism, you just have a big splat of emotionalism. You know. You may look at the world and want to scream. Okay? But is that scream art in itself? You screaming at the world, is it art? No, because you have to put a framework around it. Right, that's what art does, it puts a frame around it. Frank Zappa said this, you know. So you put a frame around it. So you put a camera up like this and you scream into the camera. Now it's becoming art, right? But it needs a bit of organisation. It needs, it needs, you know, maybe this art needs to sort of context or you need to put it into something, you need to go against something else. That's the perfectionist bit. It's really useful in that process. But if you find that you've recorded like 500 screams and you're going through them all deciding which the best one is and none of them have the emotion anymore that the original scream had, then you've got a problem. And that's the undoing of so many artists. You need to get round that circle. You need to get to the other side and get the art out there. 
When I start a new project, I have the idea for a project. And usually what happens, because I have all the ideas, I try and make a track that sounds like it should. You know, I've got all these ideas, so I try and make the track. That first track is usually a real pain to make. And when it's done, it's not very good. But what I do is I finish it and move on. And the next track is usually informed by that track, but it can still be a little bit difficult because I haven't got all the ideas. Then suddenly it drops. The whole thing just drops. The third track in drops. Oh my God, I've just nailed it. That's the process. You have to go through the process to get to there. Right, but if I was still stuck on that first track trying to fix it or going through it in a perfectionist way, thinking I can make this right. But what I do is I just go, right, that's, this track's done. It's okay, it's done. Let's move on. Right. That process is really, really important to, to being creative. I'm now getting to the realms of discussing how to be creative. And I think on this channel where I've, you know, on this channel I've been looking at music I like and looking at a lot of jazz fusion and prog. There's been some philosophical discussion, but this video I really wanted to get into a deeper discussion about music and see where that goes. It's, this video could be an absolute failure or it could be a big success, never know. But I am, I'm gonna do this anyway. And now I'm getting into the sort of how to be creative and sort of rules that will help you be too creative. And I think that is um, definitely uh, the stuff for another video. So I'm gonna draw this one to a close. I will be coming back to this issue with creativity and mental health over and over again because it is fundamental and very important. You know, but I hope you creative types who have come and watched this that this has been of some use to you. If I've discussed anything uh, that is of interest that you want me to discuss more, please put it in the comments. I've only scratched the surface on this. There's so many other things I wanted to talk to which I probably haven't, but what I've done is I've just come out here. I've tried to balance perfectionism and hedonism by basically switching the camera on and talking. I had no plan of what I was going to say. I've given it great thought, a lifetime of thought, right? I've had to deal with it. I'm, I feel I've become a better artist and I feel, felt like I've been able to manage my anxieties as I got older, right? So all that's in me, but what I've done in this video is then just switched it on and talked, right? So. The perfectionist of me will go away and go, oh my God, I didn't mention that, and I didn't mention that bit of philosophy. I didn't mention that bit, so I didn't tell that story. Does it matter? You know, the reason I didn't do that, right, I've actually got a computer here with a list of things I want to talk about, I haven't looked at it once, right? <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that the emotionalism and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the hedonism in this subject has been retained by me just letting it flow. I think this is really important. And I hope you've all got something from it. I hope that uh, you recognize certain things in there. Like I say, a lot of anxious people, like the start video I said this, they, they cover up their anxieties, they make excuses for it, right? A little tip for me, stop doing that as well. Especially, you know, if you're working with other creative people, the, 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 the lift I've got from going, I, I, I can't do this because I'm anxious about it. And then the other artist, person I know, go, I'm exactly the same. This happens on a weekly basis now because rather than trying to cover up for my anxieties by lying, which is what I used to do when I was younger, I think that that's really where the problems come from. You know, um, it's much better to just tell people straight where they're coming from and get right down to it. I think a lot of depressed and anxious people have to, um, rationalize it, make it sound more um, important and logical than it actually is. I've known people that are suffering with huge anxiety and not being able to, you know, socially interact or do anything because they were worried about their stomach rumbling. When you asked it, they didn't, never said, I'm worried about my stomach rumbling and I get embarrassed. They don't say that, they come up with something much more bigger. No, be truthful to yourself. If you look and learn to be truthful to yourself, you will be a great artist. And it doesn't matter if nobody realizes that. It doesn't matter if you don't happen to be culturally in the right time that your great art meant something to that culture. That can happen. You know, cultural relevance is really important and that's probably another video, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, 
You're a creative person. Your job is to be creative. You will solve your anxiety and depression or at least get it under control by being creative. Creativity is the therapy for anxiety and depression. There we go. Got to it right at the end of the video. As simple as that. So, hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, if you want more stuff like this, put it in the comments. If you've got any of your MP6, put it in the comments. Please like it and subscribe. I will be doing more stuff like this. Um, again, thanks for listening. Check out my other videos. And uh, again, go out and make some creative stuff. It's what life's all about. Thank you very much and I'll see you soon. Bye.